Richard Bushman is a Governor Morris Professor of History Emeritus at Columbia University and author of the forthcoming Joseph Smith Rough Stone, Rough Stone Rolling to be published by Alfred V. Knopf in October 2005. Among his written works are Believing History, Latter-day Saint Essays, and Joseph Smith, Beginnings of Mormonism. And Dr. Bushman has co-authored a number of books. He's considered to be one of the experts on Joseph Smith. Uh, I'm sure he'd be willing to sign one of his books that are back on the round table if you ask him. Yes, he's nodding. Yes, he'd be willing to sign one of his books for you. And at this moment, we'd like to turn the time over to him. So. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my first meeting of FAIR, though I've been uh, very much aware of the work of this organization for a number of years. And I'm greatly honored that uh, Scott invited me to address you. I've actually been um, leery of one of the key words in the acronym that is apology or apologist. It really is an honorable word with a great history um, and used in its proper sense really means a deeper understanding or a fuller explanation as in John Henry Cardinal Newman's Apologia Pro Vita Sua, an apology for my life, or in the book that is considered by many Christians the premier example of a Christian apologetics uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, Mere Christianity. So it's not necessarily uh, an activity of defense or combat, but one of demonstrating the power or the usefulness of certain ideas or certain ways of life. Unfortunately, when it's been applied to me, as it has been in cer certain instances, it's used pejoratively in as someone who takes a position in favor of heedless of the evidence, you know, in the sense of being a, a biased reporter. There actually is a review, the first review I saw of this forthcoming book of mine, in which the author, um, though generally favorable, said at the outset, that uh, the book has a veneer of credibility. <laughs> Presumably, no Mormon could truly be credible uh, writing about uh, Joseph Smith. Of course, as I was writing the book, I was not in the least aware of myself as apologizing for Joseph Smith or striving to justify him in any way. My aim was to, to understand him uh, rather than to, than to defend him because my approach to history basically is empathetic. I wanted to sense the world and his personality and his relationships, his thoughts, his revelations as he sensed them and as those close to him sensed him. That of course is not the only way to write biography. There are some who feel that biography at its best is, is always critical. It attempts, attempts to strip away the pretense and find the true or real self uh, under all the falsity that people project uh, in, in order to protect themselves. Uh, the Marxists used to speak of ripping off the masks of certain figures or certain classes because they believed that under the masks were the true power relationships in a society that had uh, to be disclosed and were in danger of being obscured. And Freudians the same way. There was a true and sort of a, a baser self underneath uh, the veneer of civilization. And I recognize that that style of doing biography, of doing, or of doing history in general, has its merits. There are pretenses. But I think also that if you 
rip off all the masks, there is nothing left. What we have is a series of masks. This is who we are. This is what it means to create a personality, a set of presentations of the self by which we form our relationships to the world. And in my opinion, the task of a biographer is to understand those presentations of the self, what constitutes them and how do they work. And so my aim has always been to be basically empathetic and uh, the, the approach to Joseph Smith is no different than would be my approach to Jonathan Edwards or Charles Finney or Abraham Lincoln or whoever. Uh, to me, the, the most interesting reality is the person created by the biographical subject, him or herself, and those immediately around him who, who knew that person best. So what I wish to do today is to address portions of Joseph Smith's life that have been traditionally difficult to understand and try to explain how I would approach them in this empathetic manner. Uh, that is to understand what these passages in Joseph Smith's life uh, meant to the prophet himself. When I was asked by uh, Scott to uh, give an address, and knowing this was an apologetic assembly and that I had to defend something as long as I was here, um, I asked him what are the outstanding problems, hoping to get an inventory and I'd tick them off and cut them down and throw them in the trash and all would be well in Zion. And he, he provided me with uh, a list uh, of such objections and then in a second email, another list of objections and then a third email came along and I realized that Joseph Smith is still mired in controversy uh, 200 years after his birth and doubtless always will be. Uh, there are always going to be people who want to identify flaws in his character, missteps in his life, and in every possible contradiction. But uh, faced with this bevy of questions and somewhat daunted by the task of treating them all at once in any coherent fashion, I decided that instead of treating these one by one, I would deal with the issues that loomed in my own mind as I undertook to write about Joseph Smith's life. Starting with my, the first volume, the one that's been out for a while, Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Mormonism, and then continuing into the writing of, of Rough Stone Rolling. And uh, I, I tried to re recall what were the hazards that I foresaw where I thought it was going to be difficult to understand what in the world the prophet thought he was doing. And I have five of these. I'm only going to talk about three, uh, but I'll tell you the five that came into my mind. The first was treasure seeking, the Peepstone Joe. The second was his psychology that currently has depicted him as some kind of a pathological character. The second was women, the third was women, which um, may not be exactly an issue in Mormon uh, polemics these days, I'm not precisely sure, but of course in the historical world at large, women are an issue in every subject. And Joseph does not necessarily come out as a proto-feminist in 1844, and so I thought I had to deal with that. The fourth, which I won't talk about so much, is violence, and that is the Mormon tradition of violence, uh, culminating in mountain meadows, but uh, starting in Joseph Smith's time, these accusations against him as, a, as another Muhammad, Muhammad. And the fourth is that collection, the fifth, I can't keep count here, the fifth um, is that collection of reactions and initiatives in Nauvoo that can be grouped roughly under the label megalomania. 
the sense that Joseph sort of uh, went berserk in Nauvoo, giddy with his own power, and uh, overstepped all sorts of bounds. Uh, those two I'm not going to deal with in the talk, though uh, we can discuss them in the question period if you, if you choose. Well, let me begin with treasure seeking. It's a strange one to start with, but I think it has an interesting moral to it. I'm not sure that treasure seeking is, in anyone's mind nowadays, much of a problem when it comes to understanding uh, Joseph Smith, at least not among um, anyone who has read the recent historiography. But uh, when I began work uh, on Joseph Smith in the beginnings of Mormonism in the late 60s and early 70s, it was the premier problem of Joseph Smith, couched uh, perhaps most acutely by Jan Ships in her essay, The Prophet Puzzle, in which Joseph Smith seemed to have this bifurcated history and personality. On one side, he's the young visionary, and on the other side, he's the young money digger. And the two seem to be totally incompatible. One is superstitious and kind of greedy, the other is exalted and religious and, and pious in every way. And it was interesting at that time because there were a whole set of sources lined up on each side of this divide. Um, on the money -digging, digging side, the two primary bodies of evidence were the affidavits that Flastus Hurlbut collected in Palmyra when he was on his mission to discredit Joseph Smith, and the neighbors happily provided him evidence, uh, many of the accusations having to do with treasure seeking. And the second being the 1826 court trial, which was recorded in documents whose provenance was questionable, and so no one uh, was able to say for sure whether this trial occurred, but at in these transcripts of events at, in court, Joseph Smith uh, speaks of money digging, the, even his friends speak of him as a treasure seeker and so on. Well, that set of documents were, uh, were available to Fawn Brody and everyone else who wanted to build up the, the treasure seeking side, but among faithful Mormons, among which I counted myself, the, these documents were not just judged and evaluated like every historical document was, has to be, they were totally discredited. They, they were just said to have no validity at all. The, the very occurrence of the 1826 trial was in doubt and everything was thought to be a pure fabrication. And the Hurlbut affidavits were considered to be so biased, probably almost totally the creation of Hurlbut himself, that they simply weren't taken into account. You didn't even deal with them in the faithful history of Joseph Smith. Of course, on the other side, the, on the visionary side, you have uh, countless accounts, beginning with the Joseph Smith's own records, and Lucy Mack Smith's, and Emma, and Oliver Cowdery, and Martin Harris, and many others who talked at length about Joseph uh, Joseph's um, visions. So we had sort of these two parallel histories scarcely uh, touching one another. And my question as a historian was how am I going to deal with this? Am I really going to discredit all of these documents or not? I felt like I had to deal with them in some way as evidence. Well, a couple of things happened as I began to work on this earlier book. Uh, one, it became evident that the faithful sources, Martin Harris and Lucy Mack Smith and others, also spoke of money digging and treasure seeking. So it became uh, almost impossible to deny those activities. Um, the Josiah Stoll search for treasure had always been accepted, but now it seemed apparent 
there were much more money digging in the Smiths' lives than had been thought of before. The second was a uh, change in the evidence was the 1826 trial was validated by this uh, little scrap of evidence that uh, Wesley Walders discovered um, seeming to prove that the event had taken place. And I remember as just in the middle of writing that book, all of this evidence was being debated and I had to write in such a way that I left room for those who still doubted the 1826 trial to sort of have their say and their voice and at the same time uh, to bring it within the Latter-day the, the Latter Saint canon of acceptable evidence. So um, altogether, it, my task was to conceive, not to deny money digging, but to conceive of what part it played in Joseph Smith's early life. I couldn't es escape that fact. Well, my um, encounter with Joseph's treasure seeking came in two stages corresponding to these two books uh, published uh, 20 years apart. Um, in B Joseph Smith in the beginnings of Mormonism, I was, uh, my strategy was essentially to neutralize the charge because as I was writing, the scholarship about treasure seeking and magic in general was proliferating in Anglo-American historiography. So it became evident that these practices were commonplace in the 17th century in all levels of society, in the 18th and 19th century among uh, common people and the lower classes. So that once you spread out this process so that Joseph Smith is not a peculiarly weird version of treasure seeking but that it was uh, widely practiced, suddenly it was no longer a blot on his character, his family's character. It was no more scandalous than say gambling, playing poker today a little bit discredited and slightly morally disreputable, but not really evil. And when it was found that all sorts of treasure seekers were also serious Christians, why not the Smiths too? So instead of being a puzzle or a contradiction, it was just one aspect of Smith family culture and not really anything to be worried about. Well, that's how far I got in Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Mormonism. In Rough Stone Rolling, I go one step further in a slightly more speculative vein, but one I think worth seriously considering, and that is to see magic and money digging as providential, that is, as useful in the training of a prophet. And why that uh, struck me uh, more forcibly uh, this go around was that I came to see what a huge leap of faith trans the translation commandment required. It was a totally unheard of, unprecedented charge from an angel to tell a young man to translate an ancient record without any learning, strictly by the use of a stone, the crystals or the found uh, seer stone. And I wanted to emphasize that because I think we've underestimated the problem of self-belief. Why should Joseph believe in his own revelations? We think of them as overpowering, irresistible, but we have to remember that this was a society that was filled with visionaries, filled with revelations, filled with angels coming to people, most of which were discredited. Why should this young man believe that his revelations were truly of God rather than a figment of his own imagination? You do remember that when Joseph Smith went to the hill the first time and could not get the plates out of the stone box 
for a moment, there flashed across his mind, according to Oliver Cowdery, the thought that maybe it was not an actual vision, but only a dream. In other words, his mind had concocted it rather than coming from God. So something has to prepare Joseph Smith to believe himself, and perhaps even more important, for his immediate family to believe in him too. So that instant when Joseph Smith went to Joseph Sr. and said, uh, explained that he had seen an angel visiting him in his room, um, his father's immediate reaction was, it's from God, follow the angel's advice. If Joseph Sr had not reacted that way, uh, who knows what seeds of doubt would have been planted in Joseph's mind. Well, the money digging experience prepared him for that because of the lore of the guardians of treasure. Let us say that Joseph Sr. sees it as a guardian angel over a golden hoard and interprets it that way. Is that wrong? What I'm saying is that may have helped him to instantaneously react and say, it's good, follow it. Furthermore, what was to prepare Joseph better to look into a stone than to have looked into a stone to find lost objects and therefore prepared to look into a stone to find lost words. So as I say, it's a speculative, speculative leap but considering all of the conditions of Joseph Smith's life at that time, I can see uh, the money digging as possibly having played a part in preparing Joseph Smith for the, un the unique role he was to act out in, in history. Uh, I would think the problems of his self-identity were immense, figuring out what in the world am I doing having to translate when I'm totally unprepared and I don't know of anyone before me who's been asked to do such a thing. Well, the reason I, I recount all this to you is um, to indicate how problems that seemed large at one point, almost insurmountable, the treasure seeking evidence, if it is looked at and examined and thought about, can unfold in ways that we cannot foresee at the beginning and eventually come to be seen as a fairly critical part, a, con a contribution to the development of a prophet. Well, let me go on then to um, psychology, which is one of the current ways of taming Joseph Smith. Uh, in the 20th century, and that is to label his pathologies. What psychological disease can account for his revelations? This uh, psychological analysis was not necessary in the 19th century because he was almost universally considered to be a religious fanatic. And a religious fanatic, a, a very powerful stereotype, a sort of almost as strong in Western thought as, as racial stereotypes, had come with it, uh, contained within itself, a psychological mechanism. You didn't have to explain the psychology of a fanatic. It didn't require analysis. It was just right there in the stereotype itself. Fanatics acted like fanatics. That's what it amounted to. We, the first breakout from that view of Joseph was I. Woodbridge Riley's Yale dissertation, which was published as a book uh, in 1902, at a moment when all of American social thinking was changing from moral analysis to social or psychological analysis. The moral analysis is what is good and what is evil, and why are people good and why are people evil. 
The psychological analysis is more like sick and well. How do, you, how do people get sick and what happens to them and how do you cure them and make them well? And so modern um, social politics is really based on the, this notion of, of social pathologies that must be cured rather than social uh, evils that must be denounced and, and eradicated. And Riley was the first to uh, take this tack, which has continued down to the present, and seeing in Joseph Smith an, an epileptic, and his visions were a result of his seizures. And since then, a variety of labels have been attached to him. Von Brody thought he fit Phyllis Greenacre's imposter type with his uh, weak personality that uh, f uh, a feeble kind of um, cracked up personality that gained strength when, in, when it was in its imposter roles. Robert Anderson's narcissistic personality, William Moraine's buried trauma cl uh, complex beginning with the leg operation when Joseph is so young, devastating the young boy, uh, Moraine postulates, uh, and then being suppressed where the memory and pain of this trauma rumbles around in his subconscious and shapes everything he does thereafter. Alvin's death adding to these traumas. And Dan Vogel's notion of a dysfunctional family with Lucy as a depressed mother, Joseph Sr. as an alcoholic, the family's in poverty, it's divided in religious, religion, and so forth. These um, psychological approaches to Joseph uh, have merits. They draw attention to parts of Joseph's experience that you might not other see, otherwise see. That's the whole point of a, an interpretation or as a theory, is to bring, turn facts into evidence. You make them work to sustain some thought, and therefore those facts leap out at you. You see things that were otherwise invisible. And um, so they, they are helpful, but I don't think that any of them succeed very well in demonstrating that Joseph Smith was a damaged pers person, that his life was twisted by his youthful experiences, and th therefore he became uh, fundamentally pathological which I think is uh, what these authors are really trying to do. And I'll tell you why I don't believe in these particular diagnoses of Joseph Smith's uh, psyche. Let me take the one which I believe has the most merit to it, or at least raises a significant issue and that is the impact of the leg operation. No matter how you cut it, it must have been a horrible experience. Uh, <laughs> just another aspect of my genius, things like that coming out of the time. <laughs> it must have been a, a horrible moment for him, for his family, and then to be, in effect, a cripple, an invalid, for three years in those active years, um, hobbling around on a crutch. I kept thinking of my grandson, Max, who's in the back of the room, and how he was from ages seven to 10, and how it had been for Joseph Smith to have been uh, hobbling around all that time. And I think um, work does need to be done on estimating the impact of that experience. It's just too significant. But I don't think that Moraine's um, analysis works. After reading Moraine, I consulted with a psychiatrist at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, a man named Peter Jensen, whom I happened to home teach. That was very useful. Um, <laughs> who is the head of a children's mental health center and lectures all over the world about problems of children's mental health and asked him, could a trauma like that have so marred a personality 
that forever after it would be limping through life or take uh, many bizarre expressive forms. And he introduced me to a literature on what's called the clinician's fallacy. The clinician being the practicing psychiatrist who sees patients all the time. And this method is to note cases of a similar kind and note common characteristics such as the imposter or the, the, the buried trauma victim. And then to uh, formulate these common characteristics into this typology which becomes then described almost as a law of nature. And this is the way Moraine does it, he says, to sort of sustain his interpretation. He says, he keeps referring to, this is what always happens to trauma victims. Well, what um, Peter Jensen pointed out to me is that more scientific or uh, statistically oriented psychiatrists and psychologists do is to not just look at those whose lives are damaged, but to look at all trauma victims, all children who've passed through a horrid experience. And the fact of the matter is, some of them are damaged, others survive, flourish, and rise up to live quite normal and ordinary lives. So you cannot predict solely on the basis of a trauma that a child would be damaged forever. It doesn't always work that way. You have to follow the whole life, life course. And that's uh, the problem uh, with looking at these things psychologically, is we are too much inclined because of our psychological bent to turn whatever subject we're working on into patients. We want to make them fit into our medical categories. And so we stress all their symptoms, all their agonies, and we often overlook the strengths of the subjects and their ability to overcome devastating experiences. So that's one reason why I'm uneasy about taking uh, William and Rain and actually these others quite too, uh, the, quite, uh, too seriously. My second approach, my second reason for, for doubting them or questioning them uh, builds on what I've just say, said. And here I rely on the work of Eric Erickson, a name uh, that uh, 30 or 40 years ago everyone in the room would know, probably half of you do now. Erickson is the famous uh, German psychoanalyst who came to America and had an illustrious career here as a, as a a therapist, but also as an intellectual and as a historian, his most famous book being Young Man Luther that attempted to explain uh, Luther's theology and his life and his religion and all of his experiences in psychoanalytic terms. Erickson, um, whom I studied with for a year and a half, so I got to know his, him and his work pretty well, was uh, an ego psychologist. And what that meant in those times was that he accepted the basic Freudian structural system of the superego, the ego, and the id, the id being the deep passions, the superego, the conscience, or the monitor, and the ego being the I, the conscious self that's trying to hold a life together. And what um, Erickson felt had been the error of psychoanalysis up that, to that time was to underestimate the powers of the ego. Uh, psychoanalysts, beginning with Freud, had seen the id and the superego as too cruel or, um, or unbounded forces that just crushed the ego. And it was, life was just sort of a constant struggle to, to ride this bucking bronco. Uh, that your psyche truly was. Uh, Erickson looked at the ego and its strengths and its powers to m mediate between the internal psychic forces. And he came to admire the courage and the ingenuity and the strength of people in managing 
all the th things that their culture and their upbringing had thrust upon them and that were incorporated into their personalities. Uh, he thought people were extraordinarily res resourceful in making lives for themselves uh, despite the damage that had been done to them. In fact, his theory of eminent leadership, which moved from uh, Luther to Gandhi, was that the great men, the truly influential men, are those who had suffered from precisely the psychic illnesses of their time, confronted those problems, and dealt with them. So my reply to Vogel claiming that the Smiths were uh, a dysfunctional family is that they did indeed suffer from a father who failed to provide and who turned to alcohol and treasure seeking and a mother who was under stress and poverty that was debilitating and disease. These were the ailments of, of poor rural farmers everywhere. Furthermore, I would add to his list the one that I think is most powerful, and that was the ongoing insult of class. It's equivalent to the ongoing insult of race, that those who are poor are continually thought to be inferior or incompetent in some way, degraded even. And the insult of class is everywhere in the Hurlbut affidavits. The, the uh, Smiths are, are condemned for their poverty. They're considered to be lazy and a whole set of insults that were directed at all poor, poor rural farmers in those days. And the Smiths had to live their lives under almost constant condi conditions of humiliation. So you put all those things together and you have a Joseph who did indeed passed through many sorrows, many agonies, many rages, I'm sure. But the very fact that he confronted all of those and dealt with them and rose above them was a source of confidence to those who know them. And what is most significant, I believe in this, is that Joseph Smith invested plain people like himself with dignity, self-respect, and hope. If there was ever a theology that gave hope and the promise of greatness to those who had suffered humiliation through their lives, it was the theology that Joseph Smith presented. So those are my responses to the, to the um, psychological, I call them attacks on Joseph because I sense they are just that. They're, they are attempts not just to understand him, <clears throat> but to discredit him. <clears throat> Which brings me then to, um, I guess I'm doing all right on time, to the third question, and that is the problem of women. The problem is that women were not officially involved in the church for the first decade. They were certainly important, as women always are. Emma was probably the most influential person in Joseph Smith's life. I had the feeling he talked about almost everything with her. Polygamy was probably the exception, but I, my guess is he talked to her about that at first, uh, early on, uh, too. But she was the one who went to the hill with him. She helped translate. She confirmed his faith with her belief. She was a believer in Joseph's revelations. And she consoled him, and I don't want to underestimate that. She was called, it was almost an official call to console him. Console, cons, console and consolation are two of the largest words in Joseph Smith's vocabulary. He needed consoling. He was a melancholy person who needed to be, to be upheld. And Emma did all that for him. So Joseph never demeaned her or any women that I'm know about. Emma was told to expand, expound and exhort, to write, and learn, and um, so she's a woman who is, is highly honored, but neither she nor the other women had any official 
position in the church. No priesthood, no missionary service, no preaching, no administrative authority. Some of them may have been present at councils and conferences, but they were not a regular part of the council organization. Revelations are addressed to elders and high priests, but not to women as a body. A few women are mentioned in the scripture, Emma, of course, being one, Vienna Jackson, another. They're present, receiving spiritual gifts. They're supporting their husband. They're engaged. Elizabeth Haven Barlow, whose letters I've just been reading, a woman who just wrote home to Connecticut just after the, uh, or I guess it was Massachusetts, just after the Missouri persecutions. Her mind is right out there. It's like Joseph's mind, always is aware of where the saints are, what's happening to them, what's happening to the leaders of the church. She had great scope. She wasn't just confined in a domestic sphere. She's thinking of where the leaders are, how are they getting along, and so on. So these women are involved and engaged, but they're not officially engaged and involved. Well, all of that changes rather suddenly in 1842, and I don't know exactly why. The move, women's movement is in gestation. Women are being, getting more and more active in reform. They're, they're preaching. They're finding uh, public roles for themselves, but these, these will really burst after the Seneca Falls Con Convention in 1848, slightly after Joseph Smith's time, but something in 1848, perhaps it's just sheer revelation, suddenly brings women right into the center where before they'd been on the margins, they suddenly become central. Just think in that one uh, spring or in, that one year after 1843, the relief side is organized, not just an auxiliary to the church, it's not the Sunday school, it's not the mutual primary, it is an, a branch of the priesthood. Women aren't given the priesthood, but they're a, they're a branch of the priesthood. And Emma is given an administrative role as president, not on a parity with Joseph Smith, but sort of as a match uh, to Joseph Smith's leadership of the priesthood. This is the, uh, these are the years when the doctrine of eternal marriage and sealing comes out and the partnership of, of men and women is made essential to exaltation. Women, therefore, and the, the relationship of men and women uh, becomes theologically essential. It's not just a nice thing like being kind to your neighbors, that you have, you're good to your wife. You have to be united with the wife to um, make, for the men to make their way uh, to the peaks of eternal hope. And then finally, uh, women are given the endowment, made part of the anointed council in 1843, going beyond the Freemasons and including women in the highest ordinances. Women in all sorts of cultures were excluded from the Holy of Holies. Only men were brought there, but women are brought in uh, to, to these highest realms of Mormon uh, ritual life. So all of these things together um, made a huge difference. I would add, however, and importantly, that we must not pretend that, all, that these changes meet all the expectations of modern feminists. Quite the contrary. Women are more ensconced in the home and family than ever. They're not told to go out and seek a career just like any man. They're still under the authority of their husbands. And plural marriage, of course, in a, in a way, reduces their place in the family. So this is not a feminist paradise. But they were given a role at the very heart of Mormonism, Mormon ritual and Mormon theological life that could become an anchor for their dignity and an undoubted certificate of their significance. I think in the Relief Society, there's a potential for further administrative elaboration, which I don't think we fully realized in the church even today, and may require more revelation and more expansion as the years go by. Well, what do I deduce from these experiences with three 
uh, issues in the life and teachings of Joseph Smith. Treasure seeking and um, his psychology and women. As the woman's issue illustrates, I think we must remember we will not always be able to give satisfactory answers to our critics. We will never placate our critics completely, and we should not seek to do so. If we placate them completely, we are making our gospel, our history, conform to their sense of what life should be and what the path, the path should be. In a sense, we're caving in if we become too pleasing to those around them. We have to state it as we see it and recognize that there will be differences from what our critics expect of us than of what actually happened to our people. We are different, we are strange, we're weird. It's just what Mormonism means. It's the religion of the weird. Here we are and we love it. Uh, uh, and that's just something we have to live with. It's one of the, the insults of our religion that uh, we have to bear. So that's my first comment. The second is the one that's obvious and which I've said over and over again, that when we run into a problem, we should never evade it, we should never circumnavigate it, we should head right into the eye of the storm. We should, in my experience, stating the problem exactly is half the way towards solving it. There may or may not be a satisfactory answer, but stating the problem exactly brings the issue under control and paves the way for understanding of J Joseph, trying to understand what he was up to. I won't claim that I understand everything that Joseph Smith did, and um, probably no one can uh, exactly. We live in a different time. We have different experiences but it helps to bring them uh, to state the problem exactly. Finally, let me just say briefly in conclusion that I do not feel that we have to protect Joseph Smith. We have to understand him. And personally, I take great pleasure in his flaws and his weaknesses. They make him more appealing. He's not a smooth, glazed, ideal, statue for us to examine. He was articulate, he was sharply sculpted, he was mobile and protean, he was a real minch, as they say in New York. So we shouldn't be troubled if Joseph Smith is not a perfect gentleman, if he's even offensive to us in some way. I think it's the nature of prophets that they're idiosyncratic, a little wild, a little odd even. He was not a gentle, self-effacing saint, which we have some come to believe is the ideal Christian. He was, um, if I may quote a phrase, a rough stone rolling. And frankly, I think it is wonderful that the Lord should work through people like him. Thanks. Can we answer the ones you choose to answer? And I told someone down here I prefer you throw tomatoes rather than hard questions. The tough ones. How can we come to, come to morally accept or explain Joseph's proposing to and being sealed to married women per, as per Todd Compton? It's a fact. He was married to ten women who were married to someone else. I don't know of anyone who has any answer or explanation of that that is founded in evidence. We have to create um, explanations for ourselves. Um, probably the best one is that he was very much concerned with bonding. He wanted to unite people. I concur heartily in everything Blake said earlier about blending people, unifying them in a bond of love is the essence of the gospel of Christ and of the Mormon gospel, that by working together, 
we can do more than we can alone. And Joseph Smith was obsessed with sealing, sealing everybody. And this ex happened in his life to ex sealing um, himself to, to married women. It was not a practice that was carried on, except as we know in various compensatory ways after husbands died after his death, but he thought it was right. And I don't think there's gonna be a, right now I don't see any explanation that will be satisfying to us on the, on the horizon. We're just gonna to have to swallow it, live with it, digest it, and do or die. In the months before Oliver's excommunication, what was his relationship with Joseph like? Testy. <laughs> Joseph um, was beginning to feel uneasy about Oliver and his, there are many complaints against Oliver, as you know, but um, I don't know that anyone knows the inner history of Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and plural marriage. There's so many things said about Oliver's possible involvement illicitly ahead of schedule. And what we do know is that, Joseph, that Oliver accused Joseph Smith of having an affair with Fanny Alger. And Joseph's chief concern at that time was to get Oliver to admit Joseph had never said he was himself committing adultery. Joseph was married to her. It was of immense importance to him not to be thought of as an adulterer. And because Oliver was making these, these uh, charges, uh, it uh, disturbed uh, those, those connections. So I don't think Joseph was particularly unhappy when Oliver left, despite their friendship that went back so many years. It's a tragic moment, a tragic story, but uh, it, their, their relationship un, had unraveled by the spring of 1838. Has your research validated the concept the Masonic required that, that Joseph be married prior to receiving Moroni. And that Moroni required that, that Joseph be married prior to, re, prior to receiving the plates. There's a little bit of evidence, but I don't write that down because I'm not sure that it's true. It's possible, but uh, I, know, I, I don't like to get out on ground that's too shaky. And from my point of view, that's shaky evidence. Second question, same handwriting. <laughs> do, you, do you believe that the money digging events and opportunities take common cause with the repeated visits of the angel that Joseph shared with his family describing the lives of the Nephites over several years? Describing the Nephites' lives over central years is what the grammar said, or do you mean Joseph describing for several years, the lives of the Nephites. I, hmm? yeah. I don't think he did describe the lives of the Nephites for several years. Emma, or Lucy doesn't say that. He began to describe it immediately after the first visit of Moroni in 1823. It went on for a little while, then Alvin died, and that ended it. So it's, um, um, that doesn't go on for long. I'm not quite sure I'm following. Take, take common cause with the repeated visits of the angel. I'll have to talk to you about that afterwards. <laughs> to what extent might the sea change regarding women be due to problems associated with the introduction of plural marriage? Are you implying that he's giving all of these things to women because he's in getting in trouble with women and especially Emma uh, because of plural marriage? I don't think so. I tried to argue that making Emma president of the Relief Society was sort of a sop to Emma. And Jill Dirk called me on that and said, you don't have a scrap of evidence to prove that. That Joseph had honored Emma all his life. It was, went with his sense of familial priesthood government that a, a wife would have a, a coordinate role with her prophet husband. So. In that particular case, I don't think that the hypothesis uh, can be confirmed. Joseph reportedly never succeeded in finding lost items by stone gazing. Would this failure have been a pre preparation for successful translation? <laughs> Someone was telling me um, last night that they'd got the question. 
If Joseph Smith had a seer stone and he could find lost treasure, why wasn't he rich? And it is a fact that he never did succeed in finding any treasure. I have a little argument ongoing uh, in publications with Dan Vogel about Joseph's in involvement in, stone, in treasure seeking. I don't see him ever avidly trying to be a money digger. Dan Vogel wants to turn him, this is in, into a career path that he wants to you know, become the head money digger of the United States. Um, <laughs> I see him always resisting, his father pressing him into it. I see him not really believing it was possible. Martin Harris does tell a story of Joseph Smith looking into the stones and finding a pin in some straw. And I think there is evidence that he was able to do that um, sort of thing, what uh, the magic people called a knack. He had a, had a knack. Um, but the question is asking, having failed at money digging, did that begin to turn his mind in another direction in preparing him to go towards translation. I would agree that that is a strong possibility, um, but that's more in the Vogel sense of you're defeated in your money digging ambitions, so now you try the religious route. You gotta keep your options open. Um, and that I don't think particularly true. I think he was overwhelmed by his religious experiences and uh, that's why he went in that direction. Can you comment on whether Joseph's credulity as a prophet was undermined, credibility, excuse me, credibility was undermined by the Kinderhook plates? The Kinderhook plates um, has been, always been turned into a problem. I can see we gotta quit. Um, by those who insist that Joseph Smith was, was snookered by these characters who made them up and then asked him to translate them. The fact is, he didn't actually translate them. He was sparked by them. But Joseph Smith is sparked by lots of things. I've always said that he's, he has a green thumb. He, he can plant a seed and grow it into a mustard tree. So he'll take a scripture or a Masonic ritual or something else and it sort of gets him going and then the revelation comes to him. And the Kinderhook plates might have started in that direction, but the fact is he never walked into the trap and those connivers never sprung the trap. They didn't come out and say, ha 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 ha, we've caught you off base trying to translate plates that we are bogus that the confession is not made till the 1870s. And the reason they couldn't spring the trap is Joseph didn't s step into it. He never carried on what looked like might be a translation of the Kinderhook plates. So I don't see that as really a damaging incident. Could the change in women's standing be inst instigated by the influx of English saints, i.e. suffragists, I don't think there are many English suffragists in the 1830s, 40s, and certainly not among the people who joined the Latter-day Saint Church. It's an upper middle class phenomenon, not a working class phenomenon, and we were getting the working class. How much did Joseph Sr.'s drinking influence the prophet? Not much directly. It was a source of great shame to Joseph Sr. And this one of the most poignant sentences in all of the record is Joseph Sr.'s blessing to Hiram, expressing appreciation that his son Hiram did not laugh him to scorn when he was out of the way with drink. And in, in my view, this sense of a father who was damaged, who had really failed as a father, had a powerful influence on Joseph Smith's psychology and was one of the great rewards of having the revelations of the church come to be able to provide a church that his father would accept. To what extent could the Wesley Walters 1826 dial, trial document be a forgery? Is it universally conceded among LDS historians as being authentic? I don't think 
LDS historians think of it as a pure forgery. But it is now moved into the category of all historical documents, that is, it has to be evaluated. It has its biases. It comes to light about 60 years after the event, so we have to think, worry about tampering. But I don't think it's inauthentic in the sense of being a pure fabrication. How would women's place in the church have differed had Joseph lived to be old enough to see the second millennium? That's what my wife is always asking me, so why don't you talk to Claudia? She has all the answers. <laughs> Thank you very, very much.